What's up, everybody? This is episode two of TRPT Change of Direction. For those of you that weren't here on the first episode, we just want to say, hey, make sure you go back and catch that with Terrell Brown. Great episode. Those of you who weren't here as well, this is about being an athlete. I don't care if you're a Division One athlete, you are an Olympic athlete, a professional athlete in any way, or even a high school athlete. We're talking to athletes that were doing amazing in their career, had a good career, but then literally left from there and now are succeeding in life. That's what we want to do. I think there's too many shows and podcasts that, you know, don't really give that it's just do. There's a lot of people out here that are really doing good in life after sports, but most of the time we only hear about people that are doing either really, really amazing, right? KD, um, he invested in Silicon Valley and he was in Uber and all this. Or we talk about the athletes that got the $25 million stock, but we don't talk about the athletes that are running the everyday, you know, small business that are doing good for themselves. Yeah, they might not be making the 20 million that they were during their playing days, but they are making 50, 100, $200,000 doing another business. So that's what we're wanting to talk about on our change of direction. So we have Ja'Cory Shepard here. Appreciate you, young Bundy. You oh, yeah, we're going to get that at the end. Trust hey, me, we, we got to say that for the end. That's all but, yeah. Know. But, yeah, with, this is Ja'Cory Shepard. This is like my little brother. He has Shep Up training, and we'll get into that a little later. But, yeah, Ja'Cory went to Mesquite Horn, so right down the street from me at North Mesquite High School. Then came up to the University of Kansas with me. Like I said, he's been my little brother since then. Was drafted in the sixth round by the Philadelphia Eagles then played with the 49ers and the Steelers as well in the NFL. So he has a lot of great things to share with you, not only about his upbringing throughout sports, but as well as in the NFL and then where he's at in business now. So I'm just going to let Ja'Cory kind of introduce himself a little bit about what got you into sports, not just football, but sports, period. Was it you? Was it your parents? Was it, you know, Michael Jordan, somebody you've seen on TV? Let them know what kind of got you into starting with your sports career. Uh, I would have to say what got me into it first, and I have to be kind of like most people, parents and then not just my parents alone, but my parents and also my family around. So like my uncles on my mom's side, um, and then some of my, my uncles on my dad's side, uh, they had a lot of influence on it as well, introduced me to all types of sports. Anything that had something to do with the ball, I was introduced to it, and they kind of let it be on me, on what I wanted to do uh, from there. Yeah, was there a specific sport that, you know, you got some families that'll be like, yeah, we're a football family, or was it just everybody was playing, you know, what they were good at, or like, hey, just go have, go have at it? No, everybody was pretty much playing everything. Um, obviously, being from Texas, you know, football was the main sport, so mm -hmm. I started playing football when I was knee high, and that's that's with flag, and, and I've always kind of stood out as far as when it came to my career at football in the beginning. So once I started football, that just became my first love and my true passion. And from there, as I started getting older, going into middle school, that's when I started to play basketball. Okay. Um, started to love basketball as well, but I didn't love it as much as I love football. But, exactly. you know, basketball still had a place in my heart as well. So I say sixth grade up, I played basketball all the way up until my senior year of high school. And then that's when I stopped playing basketball. And the rest is kind of history. Okay, so you, you so you played it through your junior year. You didn't play senior year, or no, did I you play? Senior, yeah. Okay, yeah. so you played senior year. So do, uh, we talked about this on the last episode. Did you see basketball as a hindrance at any time to football? Because you know some people, and we we're getting different perspectives on it. Like, hey man, like you know you about to be a Division One football player. Why are you playing basketball every time? You might get hurt, or you could be training in the off season. So did that bother you at all? Or you was like, no, I I want to hoop. It's fun, and and that's what I'm doing. Yeah, no, nah, it didn't bother me at all. Everybody gonna have their opinion. But at the end of the day, I knew why I was playing basketball. I loved it. Yeah, I knew that, you know, I wanted to go to college for football, I wanted to play in the NFL. But at the same time, I was good at basketball. And I looked at it as another opportunity for me to work on my game when it came to football. Exactly. You know, having that exposure, having that quick twitch movement when it came to playing defense. Exactly. And that was something that I took pride on. When I first started playing basketball, I wanted to be the best defender on the team. Whether I was playing Shit, and um, here in in Dallas, or you know, if I was playing for Team Colorado, I played for Team Colorado one year in the sixth, sixth, seventh grade. Okay. And um, you know, I didn't, I didn't care that you know I was from Texas and I was a football player playing basketball. What some people would think, 
because when you seen me play, it was like, oh, no, he played basketball. That's a basketball player. Exactly, exactly. No, that's actually funny because we'll, we'll get into that a little later once you went to Kansas and oh, started yeah. playing defense, <laughs> and we know how much you loved offense, but then now to be like, oh, well, you were wanting to be a best, the best defender, mm -hmm. not knowing that you would eventually become one of the best yeah. defenders when you went up to the University mm -hmm. of Kansas. So let's talk about the recruiting a little bit. So I know – when I um, first met you was when you came up to the University of Kansas. When I first seen you, like I was telling you earlier, yeah, was a &M game. Yeah, yeah, there. And then in the summer, yep, you summer. were committed to uh, Iowa, Iowa, right? Yep. So you were committed to Iowa, and I remember I talked to you. It was like, nah, bro, we got something good going up here. Iowa ain't about to throw you the ball yeah, and this yeah. and that. Like, why are you going out there to the Big Ten? They run the ball. Come out here with me. You know, I'm a small receiver like you, and but I'm playing DB at the time. Like, you know, kind of take up from where I was at and go ball at that. But like I said, when I first saw you was at the field in Mesquite and I was back from college, you know, training, doing my thing. And some people said, oh, there's Ja'Cory Shepard and Ja'Keen Grant. I was like, who? They was like, Ja'Cory and Ja'Keen, the receivers from home. I'm like, bro, I'm in college. I don't know nothing about these young boys. Y'all stop telling me about these boys. They ain't nice as me, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, but then, you, you know, I mean, that, that's just how it is. But then when you came up there, you know, I introduced uh, myself to you mm -hmm. and Pops, and then we got you to move on over to um, Kansas. Kansas. Yep. So what was that? Because uh, a lot of people see, and it's better now, but see a stigma of decommitting. Like, what was that like from you, for you being with mm -hmm. Iowa? Like, did you call? Was it Pops? What did nah, you do to, like, decommit from them? Man, say that. That process was, it was nerve-wracking. <laughs> I bet. Because, you know, I jumped on Iowa. That was my first offer. Okay. And, you know, coming from, you know, my family, my uncle, he, he went off to play. But when he originally got his offer to go off and play D-ball, he didn't go. Okay. He want, you know, he wanted to stay home at the time and, and later decided to, you know, continue to go and play. But, you know, I was really the first person to kind of go through that process. And so when I got that first offer, in my head, I'm like, I don't want to lose this offer. Like yeah, you're like, I, I'm yeah. nice, but you know what I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going yeah. here. And this was my junior year, so I'm like, cool, I'm finna commit. Especially, yeah. well, I ended up taking a trip out there. I ended up taking a trip, and man, when I seen that crowd, that was the first time I seen yeah. a stadium that big. And it, I think they stadium hold over 50,000. 50, Easily. And I know Big Ten got some yeah, big I think like stadiums seven, I think out there. like 70,000. Probably like so. And it was a spring game, and when I tell you, when I walked out there, and they was just screaming my name, like, Jacory, you know, saying Shepard. And I'm just like, yeah, I, I like that. And yeah. that was my first They got you with the recruiting yeah, process. So they like, literally hit you so with that recruiting yep, trip. I remember we was on the way home, and I had took that trip with another buddy. He was, he was an Allen receiver, Jay, Jay Lee. And I told him, like, I think I'm going to commit, bro. I'm going to go and commit. So yeah. when I got home, I called him, and I let him know, like, yeah, I, I commit. I want to come there. And then, like you say, fast forward to now here comes Kansas mm -hmm. into the picture. I ended up coming out there, meeting y'all, and, you know, just watching the practice. Being at Horn, it was a spread offense. Exactly. So I already, in my head, saw, you know, where going to Iowa could kind of hinder, mm -hmm. you know, my, my playing. 100%. But Especially in 2010. Yeah. yeah I was like, was, you know what I mean? When I committed to uh, Kansas, you know, they were throwing the ball. Mm -hmm. Well, when I went to Kansas, Baylor was the worst team in the Big 12. TCU was in the Mountain West not yep. throwing the ball. So, especially, like, even though Iowa doesn't throw it now that much, think about in 2010, they definitely wasn't no, they throwing the ball. Throwing. So, I, I know what they you mean right there. So, you know, when I took that visit out there to, um, to Kansas and, you know, talking to, talking to you and watching the, watching the practice and stuff, when I got back home, I was like, dang, I can I could see myself in that offense. Exactly. You know, I feel like that fits me more, you know. They want to use me at Iowa as, you know, a little gadget guy in a return. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I can run routes. Like, no. Nah. You know, I've been I've been working on my route running and stuff. I can run routes. So 100%. when we came up there and, you know, I got to see the playbook, mm -hmm. it was identical to Horns. Exactly. Only thing, the difference was the terminology. So I don't know if you remember this, but when I came out there and I took that visit and y'all was in film room. Yeah. And remember I said, I said, y'all better get ready because I'm coming out here to play. Exactly. And a lot of them guys laughed. Yeah. They, you know, at the time, they're like, man, who's this little, who's this little guy right here? Exactly. But I, that's when I had found out about the playbook being the same. So, you know, I knew I, the type of player I was. I'm a smart, smart person. So I was like, you know, I'll get this down and be able to walk into the situation. 
like I've already been there, which is getting accustomed to being with you guys, fitting in with the team. Exactly. So that's um, a real good thing for our young athletes to realize. Ja'Cory said he committed off of, you know, sheer up. They were my first offer. I don't want to lose it, right? There is a time for that. So say if Ja'Cory was a senior and it was game eight of the senior year and he just got his first offer from Iowa or any college and that's your only one, I would say commit. But if you're a junior, you know, he was a high, ended up being a high uh, recruit, uh, take your time. Make sure you really – your Look options. at that school, right? Weigh those options, and then you don't want to get in the, the commit, decommit, commit, mm -hmm. decommit game, which it happens. So for those athletes out there that are in a situation they don't want to be in, don't feel bad about decommitting because guess what? That coach will tell you as great as you are and how much he loves this school, when he gets a bigger job offer, he is going to go. He is going to go. So if you find something better, you go. And with Ja'Cory's situation, I know I talked to him about it when he was visiting, was like, hey, man, don't look at the front of that jersey. Don't look at those things. You don't fit in Iowa's offense. You have to go to a school that fits what you do. And like he said, Horn and Kansas had the same playbooks, the same type of routes, the same type of, you know, terminology was different, but the same type of players was at Horn and KU. Like, let's go down the field. Let's make some plays. Let's throw the ball. So when – Looking at these colleges, don't go to Texas just because they're Texas and they got five other running backs that were number one in their class before you. Go down to Baylor. Go over to, I don't care, Kentucky, where it's going to say, hey, you know, we use scat backs more than just down the hill backs or vice versa. So really look at that when you're committing to these schools. Well, let's talk about now we'll fast forward to you coming up to Kansas, right? So we know um, Ja'Cory played wide receiver when he first got there. And when he first got there, he was actually behind me. I, it was, I was in my senior year. I talked about it on the last episode of, you know, I had a real good thing going as far as my NFL prospects. Well, first game of the season, I went out there. I scored a touchdown. We went in for a rain delay, came back out. I tore my groin. Well, after that, Ja'Cory plays for the rest of the game. Had three touchdowns, 100 and something yards, right? 180. And I'd say went crazy. You know, that's the first game of his college career. Um, after that, I told him, I was like, man, you got something. So just take us back a little bit, like what you were thinking of, like, because I know I did the exact same thing. My true freshman year, the senior in front of me got hurt. And I played the rest of the game, had my one of my best games of my career, which that was one of the best games of your career. Same thing, senior gets hurt. Tell us what you were kind of feeling when I went down and you were like, well, I got to step up and, and play, and then you went to be able to make those big plays. Yeah. Well, initially, you know, I'm like like every other player, like, hell yeah, I get to go in. Exactly. Like, you know, it's my time now. But like you said, we bonded from the beginning. So throughout training camp and practice and stuff like that, I respected your game. So going into the season, I wasn't one of those players like, I should be playing. I don't understand why he in front of me. He's just playing because he's a senior. It was like, okay, no, nah, he got game. You took me under your wing. You was kind of showing me you know, how to go about practice and all that type of stuff exactly. when it came to studying film. So, you know, I respected you in that manner to where when you got the start and you was playing, I'm like, cool, I get the opportunity to kind of sit here and watch. But at the same time, I'm itching. I can't wait to go in. I hope exactly. I get in. You know, Coach Jim has said that I would play, exactly. but they didn't say when. So in my head, I'm like, man, I ain't going to play. They ain't finna let me play. You you just coming back. You, you know, you had a good year before, so it's like, you know, he finna play this whole game. Uh, so when you went down, like I said, I was just excited to get in. So when I stepped in, first thing I'm thinking is, man, just give me the ball. I just want to get That's the ball. That's what the playmakers I, do. I just want the give ball. It to me. You know, I I was itching. I was hungry to to show the University of Kansas and show the show the people that you know I was here and that I was here to kind of make an impact on the program. And that's. That's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to make an impact on the program from day one. That, that, that's cool. Um, so for a little background story, like we kind of went into it real quick, but when I was a true freshman, I had a senior in front of me. In the very first game of the season, he got hurt. I went in and I killed it. When Ja'Cory came, I was the senior. I got hurt. Ja'Cory killed it. And I had been telling him way before the first game of the season, I was like, man, you know, you're the same type of player as me. You uh, remind me of myself. You're a hard worker. You run routes. You, you're a student of the game. We're from the same city. I was like, your career reminds me a lot of mine. And I said, in some ways you might not want to hear, I said, but I'm going to tell you this. At some point, depending on what you're doing, 
you might get moved over to a corner. I got moved over to the corner my freshman year. And he's like, no, I, I'm a ball, yeah, DP. I'm a right. ball. I was like, bro, <laughs> I'm telling you just how things are making out, the shape of our offense, you might get moved. Don't, don't be mad at that. Take it and run with it. That's what happened to me. I took it and ran with it, came back to receive it. So, Ja'Cory, was it freshman year or no, it's so- it sophomore, sophomore year, right? Yeah. Because I, I, I got hurt. I was out for the full season. Ja'Cory yep. finished the season at receiver. Well, my sophomore year, I came back, mm-hmm. and I was back starting again. Ja'Cory was behind me, but that's like, he's a playmaker. Let's move him outside, that's, that's right? When we, yep, that's when the new staff came in. Exactly. Too. Um, when Coach Weiss, exactly. so when Coach Weiss then came in, and that's that's like that's how it started. They were like, let's move him outside mm-hmm. because they wanted to. They was initially they was trying to find a way to keep you in the slot and then have D on the field at the same time. Exactly. So you know they tried to play with that whole scenario, but you know from there. And I remember that when you went outside, it was just a new position for you. Uh, I think you were previously hurt coming into. The- I hurt my um the first day uh-huh. when we was running them fade balls. I caught the ball, came down, and gave myself a hit point. Exactly. First so day, first day so then time. you lose time right there. Yep. So then they approach you with a position change. What's the first thing that goes through your mind when they say, hey, we want you to now move on the other side of the ball? Why? <laughs> Hell no. <nah. laughs> For what? Why am I moving position? You know, after you went down, I think, I, matter of fact, I ain't no thing. I was the leading receiver. Exactly. As, as far as touchdowns, I led, and I didn't even play – the rest of the season, all the games, I started a few more games that season. But exactly. for me to have the type of career, the, the type of freshman season I had, I was expected of being able to go in competing to be a starter. Exactly. So now you got the new staff come in, and like you say, they had you slotted at the one. And something you didn't mention, they had another guy, a freshman coming in. Yeah. So they had a freshman coming in, and they had him slotted before me. Yeah. And I was at at third, so that's why they. That was Trey, up. right? Little yeah. Trey. So yeah, they yeah. had they had a freshman in front of me, and that's when they was like, you know, that's that's not right. Let's try to move him on the outside to get him on the field. And when that when that kind of happened, that's when I first experienced, you know, what you were saying as far as you know, be careful, you know, watch yeah. watch the moves that they kind of make. That's when I first experienced it, like you say, coming coming back from my freshman year, being one of the leading receivers. And now y'all asking me to move the defense? Like, exactly. Hell, no, nah, I don't want to move the defense. But, but I've always been a team player. So, exactly. um, when they asked, first thing I did, I called my dad. <laughs> and I said, Dad, you, you got to laugh. And he just said, they moved you to corner, huh? <laughs> and I was like, yep. His, my whole basketball career, he had been saying, you would make a hell of a corner. Mm-hmm. Just because of my high play defense, and then right, you know, we went back to that. You're a defensive he guy. He was like, you know, how you play defense? You got explosion. You smart and all that. So he wasn't shocked at all. Me on the other hand, I'm like, man, I don't understand this. This is crazy. But you know what? I'm gonna go on and do it. And my approach was, I played my first year right. Exactly. So I was like, cool. I go ahead and make the switch. A lot of people didn't think I could do it, so I love that. I'm a competitor. So I love when people doubt me. So I yeah. took that as fuel to the fire. I got people doubt me. They moving me, not really expecting me to succeed. Mm-hmm. And so. To say, was, basically to say, hey, we gave you a chance. Basically. And then throw you away. Like, we gave you a chance. Basically. You should have did something with basically, it. But, yeah. you, but you took advantage so, of that. So, you know, they had that in mind. And that's when we had Coach Campo. Exactly. So being from Dallas, I knew who Coach Campo is. So I'm like, if Dave Campo say I, he think I can make a good corner, shit, I believe him. So. I was like, shit, I'm all in. So, for me, it was just changing my mindset from that receiver mm-hmm. to that DB. And it was just really about the physicality of the game. Yeah. One to, one to make tackles. Did you uh, play corner nope. at Horn? I never played DB. So, so, mine was a little different. So, when I was at, in high school, I started both ways. Yeah. But I didn't practice corner. You know, you're, if you're an elite athlete, you yeah. know what I mean? In high school, you're not playing against elite athletes every game, right? So I didn't practice, but I just started versus the teams that passed. Mm-hmm. Now, if they're a run team, they know, yeah, don't throw right. DP in there. I ain't like making no tackles. So that's even different. So like me, when they move me mm-hmm. over, it's like, well, I, I've done this before. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, not at this level or having to get technique savvy like that and really lock in, but I've done it. You had never yeah, done it. So yeah. it's just like you have to totally change your mind. I did. I had to, I had to totally flip. But, again, I was so determined um, to make it to the league. Yeah. As a young kid, I always I knew I was gonna make it to the league. 
I would always have dreams of, you know, coming out of a tunnel with lights, but that was it. You didn't know what position? I didn't know what, nothing. But you, no you, you would have no figured number. it would have been wide receiver, though, oh, right? I thought I'm a receiver, 100%. 100%. Exactly. You know, especially after how the freshman year went, I thought it was going to be receiver 100%. So, you know, when that, that flip happened, Again, it was just a competitor to me, like, no, I'm going to prove everybody wrong. So that happened in the beginning of the sophomore year. Mm-hmm. And by the end of the sophomore year, I was starting. I started the last three games. Exactly. And so going into junior year, I knew that I was going to have to work on my technique. I was going to, with no technique, just being an athlete out there, basically hooping. Was that the hardest uh, transition technique from being a wide receiver? Was it the mindset? Was it? The physicality, was it technique? What was the hardest transition from being a wide receiver to then going over to be a DB? For me, I think it was more mentally and trusting what you see with mm-hmm. your eyes. Because, again, my approach to the game, I've always had that student of the game mentality. So yeah. learning the technique, it wasn't hard as long as I had a good teacher. And so after the sophomore year, when I came home, I got with Clay Mack. Yeah, and that's one. And everybody knows everybody Clay knows out Clay here. Mack. Shout out to Clay Mack yep, out yep. here in Dallas, Texas. He's been doing it for a long time. Um, works footwork, works for DBs, whole nine. So shout out to Clay Mack. Yes, sir. So you know that's what I got with him. And you know I just told him I was like, look, <laughs> I ain't never played DB, but I know I I got everything that you would want in the DB. I just need to know the technique and the fundamentals. So from day one, man, Coach Mack, I've been. I was working with him. Well, I've been playing DB, what, six years now? If yeah. I was still playing. So, yeah. been working with him for that long. And, and that's what kind of helped me get my technique and my fundamentals right. And from then, it was just understanding the game more and coming with experience. Like yeah. you said, I never played DB. I've always played straight offense. From yeah, cool. Pee Wee all the way up until I got out there, it was always either running back or receiver. So, when I moved to DB that first time, that was it was literally my first time ever playing so, DB. So, being you – was wide receiver, even though so you started excelling at DB, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, you get drafted. So at that point, did you start liking DB more than wide receiver? Or were you still like, man, I'm still a wide receiver at heart? So it took took after that junior year. After I had the junior year I had, Mm -hmm. that's when I was like, yeah, I can do this corner shit. I can (laughs) can be a good corner. And a lot of that came from – just how things went my junior year, but then I that's when I made I made second team. Okay. All Big Twelve. And that was when, you know, A C Aaron Coleman was coming out and they had all them guys. Yeah, had some good uh, corners Gilbert, out, of, out yeah. of Oklahoma. Yeah, so all them guys was they was first team. So I'm like, dang, okay, it's my first year ever playing and I got that. So that's when it kicked in. Like, yeah, I I can do this. Okay. So okay. <laughs> going into that senior year, I just he was locked in, oh, ready was locked to go. In. I was locked in, ready to go. Me, on the other hand, I started actually doing good. I started on the opposite opposite side of Chris Harris Jr. Mm-hmm. Um, my I started my second half of my freshman year, then all of my sophomore year to about game seven, and it was me and Chris Harris. At no point did I like it. Yeah. I was a small body, so as a receiver, I didn't get hit. I got tackled. I would get tripped up. You know, I was a quick guy. Yeah, that's- Weighing 157, and you playing against OU and Texas and taking on those guys, my body was too banged up. So the first chance I got when Turner and Gill and them came in and Coach mm-hmm. Mangino and them left, I ran my butt fa- yep, back to back the receiver as fast as possible. I said, this corner stuff is, you yeah, know, cool done for me. It was too much of a beating on my body. You are, you're a bigger guy than me. Yeah. And like I said, so you really started excelling. So you get drafted in the sixth round by the Eagles, right? So you like, man. I just knew I was going to play wide receiver, wide receiver. But I went to the NFL at a totally different position that I learned in college that I had never played before. Like, what was that feeling like to get drafted at something you've never done before? So you want my, my the real answer? No, I, I told you, we out here, we got to keep it real. If it ain't real, don't say it. We'll go to the next question. So, I want the real answer. Uh, no, nah, honestly, man, when I got drafted, I was kind of mad. Yeah. As crazy as it sounds. I was happy. At the end of the day, I was happy, yeah. Yeah. But I was pissed off. Uh, like you say, just my journey. Yeah. I moved to DB. That senior year, I got first team, Big 12. I go to the senior senior bowl. First day, I'm snapping. Yeah. Philip Dorsett, you know, covering him man-to-man deep balls. 
PBU, whatever you call it, picks. So, hurt my hammy. Yeah. First, first play of seven on seven, hurt my hammy. So okay. I had to pull out of the senior bowl. Yeah, I remember because right. at uh, um, at pro day, you you so, ran the forty, so, right? So look, but so but you to, was hurt. So I had to pull out of the pro day. I had to pull out of the senior bowl. That was the first tough decision of that process because this that was my first opportunity, like really showcase, like. I can play, yeah. I'm from and get the best too. A, you know what I'm saying? Like I can play, yeah. I know I'm from University of Kansas, Big Twelve, whatever y'all want to say, but no, we got some players in Kansas. We got some players in the Big Twelve. Exactly. So like I really had that chip on my shoulder. Um, I was on the Jaguars team mm -hmm. at that time, and like I say, when I went down, man, it was it sucked because I was like, damn, this is my first real opportunity to show everybody that. I can keep up with the Alabama receivers, with the Ole Miss receivers, exactly. with, with, you know, all them type of guys. The so, SEC elites. Yeah, so when that happened, you know, it hurt. So, you know, I, I went home, and I knew I had a month to get ready for the pro day. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, no, I take that back. I had a month to get ready for the combine. Yeah, true. So true. when I went back, I was like, okay, cool. Let me try to get my hemi right so that way I can do the drill at the combine. So I, I wasn't right. Yeah. So I knew I wasn't right. So I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna try to do the first drill. If I can, if I can manage to do the first drill, I'll try to do what I can. Yeah. So the first drill, I go to open up. I felt my hammy pull, so I shut it down. Yeah. So that man, that that shit hurt. That hurt missing the combine. Well, being there, watching all them guys compete, watching them do things that I know I can do. You're a competitor. I, you you, know you can see it with your eyes. You right there. You're right like, there. I know. I, uh, how I stack up, but you're just not able to not show able it. Not able to show it. And I knew how important that was for me, being that I hadn't played DB so long mm -hmm. and being able to be in front of all them eyes. And I was like, I'm the type of play person. If you show me something and if I rep it, if I get it, I'll make it look like I've been doing it my whole life. Exactly. Because it's just my mentality. I want to be a perfectionist. So when it came to the drills that was going on in the combine, man, I would have killed those drills. Exactly. So for me to have to sit there, and I've been watching the combine with my dad growing up. Wake up early in the morning you know, to watch that on so Thursday through Sunday. Wait. I couldn't wait for my opportunity. I couldn't wait for that to happen. So for me to be there and not be able to actually do nothing, that, that hurt. I knew I had another month, though. Exactly. I knew I had another month before our pro day. So I was like, you know what? It is what it is. I don't want to put no bad film out there, no bad tape. Cool. Fast forward to the pro day. Two days before the pro day, I'm feeling great. You know, I, I don't worked out. My hemi feeling good, everything. Mm -hmm. Two days before the pro day, I was like, man, let me just see where I am with my 40. And at this time, you know, I was I was able to come back and work with y'all. Exactly. I was able to come back and work with y'all and, and work on my 40 starts and all that. So I'm like, man, let me just see where I'm at right now. So, you know, I ended up running, and the last five yards, I heard like a pop in my, in my hamstring. So I hit up. Uh, Hit up the trainers and asked to get an MRI, and it showed that I tore my tore my hamstring completely. And this was two days before the pro, pro day. day. So at that point, I had a decision to make. I asked the trainer. I said, "Can I make it? Can I make it worse?" He said, "No, you completely tore it. So it's just on what you what you can do, your pain tolerance." So I said, "All right, cool. This was my last shot." In, in my eyes, you know, I gotta do it. Whatever I, I, I do, I gotta I do it. I had to do it. We had a new staff come in. So there were some people that was there who felt they could have said something, but they, you know, that's that's, that's hard to, yeah. to, you know, tell a kid, sit this out, and this is your Especially chance. when it's your shot. Yeah, you it's know. my shot. It's my last shot. And we had 27 scouts. 27 scouts there. Because I didn't do none at the combine. 27 scouts came, came to the pro day to see what I was going to do. So the agreement was I wasn't going to run a 40. I was able to talk him into not me not running a forty because I knew I can't open up. Yeah, my I hamstring like, you know, messed I up. I can finesse the DB drills. I ain't gonna do none of the jumping, none of that. I don't, I don't care for that. So they was cool with that. So I'm on the inside while everybody outside going through the pro day. I get a call from uh, Murph, the head trainer at the time. Hey, they want you to come out here. They want you to run. What? No, nah, what you mean they want me to run? They said I ain't have to run. They said it was cool. Well, they they don't stop the stop the pro day, and they they say they either want you to run or don't do nothing at all. 
<laughs> so there you go. Backed you into a corner without you so, knowing. My agent, not there. University of Kansas, they didn't allow agents to be at the pro day. So I called my agent. And he, you know, he's like, at this point, you know, it's, I can't. It's on you. What you want to do? So I'm like, you know what? All right, I'm going to go out there. So when I went out there, I had no intentions of running. I was just going to try to find my way to talk him out of, you know, yeah. running. Like, the plan was me giving him a 40 at the end of the pro day. And I knew I wasn't going to run it. But when I went out there, they was they really meant that. Like, no, if you don't run a 40, you don't want to see nothing. Yeah. So I'm like, wow. And I'll never forget, it was a Kansas City, <laughs> a Kansas City Chief scout. He was like, are you scared? You got something to hide? Man, when that man said that, hey, that, that <laughs> hey, hey man, <laughs> well, they scouts for a reason, right? Man, they do their job for a reason, and, and they know how to put, hey. push and pick and prod at athletes. That's what yeah. they do, right? They know it's like if you want to fight somebody in school, you gonna talk about their mama in front of everybody, right? Because I want to see what you about. I know what's gonna get. And for an athlete, but you got something to hide. You slow. You ain't good. Yep. Bet. So, I ain't got no <laughs> shoes on. I can be in some roller blades. I'm about to run this 40, right? That's no, what you was thinking. So. so when he said that, that was that was my that was it. That was my last draw. So like I went off. I was like, what? I got something to hide. I ain't got shit to hide. Like you could turn the tape on. Like I don't gave up two, three touchdowns in the Big 12. I ain't never played corner. So what do I have to hide? I'm running with guys all day who run a four, 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 three. But yeah. you, what do I got to hide? You see the tape? Yeah. So when he said that. I was like, no, I'm gonna give y'all 40. I said, after I run this 40, don't don't ask me to do shit else. So <laughs> I ran the first 40. And you probably can look this tape up. I was running like with a little deal. Mm -hmm. I remember. Because my, my hamstring was torn. So I ran that first 40. I ran a, a 4 6. They had the nerve to ask me to run another one. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't good enough. I know you hurt. They do asked it me again. to run another one. Do it again. Yep, they asked me to run another one. So you know what? I ran another one. Long story short, I ended up dropping four rounds. I was a projected second round pick, early third at the latest. From the second round until the time I got picked, I was a top five pick available. Yeah, and your, your name just going across just the screen. So for all y'all that third to four, watch the combine, you see the top five available guys. His name's on it the whole time. Started at five and worked his way up all in one. And to not get that call into the sixth round, I told Philly, like, oh, y'all, I feel so – I'm happy for the opportunity, but I feel so disrespected. And I was like, y'all finna get a dog. Exactly. And shit. So you go up to Philly, right, and you're up there. You're making your way. We already know you you playing in the ball. Mm -hmm. And then, boom, more setback. ACL, correct? Yep. What 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 goes through your mind? So I, I, I get drafted. I'm already got a mindset of I, I, I got to beat these people into the ground. They, mm -hmm. they made a mistake. It's the – Classic, you know, underdog mm -hmm. my whole life. I'm ready, you, but you're still at your dream, right? We've mm -hmm. seen many six-round picks and, yeah. and free agents go off. Chris Harris Jr., yep. free agent, right? Yep. Antonio Browns of the world, Tom Brady's of the world, late picks and ball. So you're there, ACL. Mm -hmm. What goes to your mind? Why me? Why me? Um, prior to that injury, I was just named a starter. Yeah. In a nickel, they had just traded um, their four-year starter. Yeah, and I do that remember was, that. That was all off just OTAs. They seen the potential. They this is our potential. guy. After, I'll never forget. Rookie mini camp is a, is a three-day camp. Mm -hmm. After the first day of camp, they shut me down. Yeah. They said we've seen all we need to see. We don't want to risk you hurting your hamstring again. So, after individuals, you done. Yeah. So the last two days, I ain't do nothing. I'm chilling. And so we go into the second week OTAs, and I kid you not, they, they cut him. And I was yeah. named a starter, and a week before the first preseason game, it was the first open practice. I was going, it was, uh, we was in a zone coverage, cover four. Yeah. I was going out to the flat, quarter flat, and uh, Sproles was coming out, coming out from the backfield, and I went to thud him up, him being shorter already. He was yeah. already underneath me. When I went to thud him up, my right foot it stayed in the ground. Yeah. So when we hit, we met in the middle. All that weight shifted back. Yeah. And so I just remember feeling like somebody took a sledgehammer and just hit the outside of my knee. Yeah. And I know I remember reading that. I was like, like I said, 
from the time I seen you on your visit to the whole time through this process while being at KU, while I was healthy, I want to see you shine. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was hurt, I really went into overdrive of I want to see you shine. When you went to DB, I looked at you and said, there's a little DP, I told you, right? But I want to see you shine. We went through all that. So to see that for me hurt me to be like, oh, like there's nothing I can tell anybody bad about Ja'Cory. Like there's other guys be like, that's my dog. But do, you yeah. know, do a little crazy. You know, sometimes karma come back and get you. You don't yeah. wish that on nobody. That's but then it hurts for people that you can go through and turn over every stone and be like, but why would it be him? Like yeah. just like you said, why me? That's the same thing we're thinking back home, like, why Ja'Cory, like, dude and worked his tail off to get here, and then boom. Yep. So so that sucks. So I know you had a long, grueling rehab process. Mm -hmm. So just tell us just a little bit just about, like, what it was like to, you know, get your dream, ACL happen, and then what was your mindset going into, you know, rehab and saying, like, let me get back to, you know, my dream. So, uh, um I actually had the same mindset that I had when it came to the hamstring injury and going into the draft. Yeah. So that same mentality, like, shit, I'm going to be comeback player of the year next year for Philly. Like, yeah. that was my mindset. Like, I'm finna really bust my ass this, you know what I'm saying, this uh, off season, and even during the season as I could to I want to get right to where I'll pick up right where I left off. Exactly. And that was my mindset. And after that season, I stayed up there. Um, the first little break we got, I stayed up there and I was continuing to work on my rehab. Once I got cleared to mm -hmm. run, that's when I came home and I continued. That's when I started working with Coach Coach Pat Pops. Yep. Started working with him and he was making sure that the, the rehab from ACL was great. Um, knee came back stronger, never had no problem at that point, no problem with it. So mm -hmm. once that had happened, it was like, okay, now it's time to go again. So again, Going back into that second year, staff got fired. Yeah. So now I'm faced with another more adversity. More adversity. A new coach. Yeah. So the new coach come in and it was like I had to put myself all over again, which was fine with me. But I'm also a guy come off ACL injury. Exactly. With no film. That's tough to do for like even guys with film because it, it's uh a league where you're trying to replace people anyway. Like, if if you're able to find somebody better than, for instance, Tom Brady, he's he's the GOAT, right? He hasn't had his, like, last year wasn't his best season. But the fact of, and this don't happen for most people, but it's still a good point, that you can win six Super Bowls and people still want to replace you. So it wasn't like the Patriots are just trying to replace Tom this past year. I think what when Garoppolo left, he won, like, two more Super Bowls after, I think they were only on four. Mm -hmm. I know they won one for a fact. So for a guy that doesn't have film, who's just in the league, coming off an injury, you know they want to replace you now. Like, we don't know you, we didn't draft you. This this is a yeah. new staff. So I, I know that that's tough. So I know you get back, and we'll go through this a little bit. You go to the um, 49ers, mm -hmm. you get on the field, you're doing returns. Mm -hmm. you know, I remember you getting out there, you in, you in live action. So how was, you know, that just a little bit of – how was that to finally feel like I'm in the league, I'm playing in a real game? It felt good. It felt good. That happened because when they fired Chip mm -hmm. in Philly, he got hired in San Fran. Yeah. So he knew what I was capable of when I was 100%. Exactly. So that's how I ended up getting out in San Fran. Okay. When I got there, their starting nipper had just went down for his ACL. So I was supposed to be coming in filling that spot. Kick return wasn't even in my mind. It just popped up opportunity. Let popped me go get it. Popped up as opportunity. So when I got there again, Chip didn't have as much control. It was mm -hmm. coming from up top. So anytime that I was supposed to get the opportunity to get out there, they put somebody else out there. Yeah. So I was like, all right, cool. I see the situation. I got to make my money on special teams, and then I'll show them that I can play DB in the offseason. Okay. So it was week seven or week eight, kick returner, Fumbled, fumbled the ball a few times, and boom, they threw me out there. I was supposed to go in as an off returner. So when I went out there, playing against the Saints, um, Miss hit the ball. It went right to me. So my first return, I think it was like 42 yards. So Toting. Toting. So, so after that, after my first return being 42 yards, they were like, 
Shep, you're the main returner. So from week eight. Same thing, right? It's not an injury, mm-hmm. but what happened with me, injury goes down, you take advantage. Mm-hmm. Now, bad kick, opportunity comes yep. to you, I'll take, take advantage, advantage of it, and now now you're that guy. And that's all I was waiting for. I've just been itching, waiting on my opportunity. And I got it. It wasn't that DB, but I got it. And I was like, I'm going to take advantage of it. And I did. I had three returns for like 150, 60 yards, something like that. Yeah. So and from that point on, I was starting to hit return the rest of the season. Cool, cool. So we've talked about the ups and downs. And like I said, I wanted to actually go longer on this sports side because I know a lot of people are going to tune in, right, because they're going to see – Corey Shepard, Terrell Brown, hopefully one day OVJ and all these names. So they're going to want to really relate mm-hmm. to that. So I wanted to go a little longer for people to hear like your yeah. story. Like this is not easy, but I had to fight. I had to keep going. So we know then after doing a little um, returns with the um, 49ers, you just did a little bit with the Steelers. Mm-hmm. But ball didn't stop there. But we're going to transfer over to our change of direction side, right, being the CEO of Shep up. Yes, sir. Okay, so now what we want to talk about is what was that trans transition like for you? It's like I still want to play ball because I know I got it. I've been injured, but I got to make money elsewhere. So what was that like for you to transition from football while still trying to play? Because our last episode, T. Brown was done. Mm-hmm. And when he went in, it, you still have actively done stuff. So what is that like? Uh, it, was, it, was, it was tough. Um, the first two off seasons – you know, I was still – I'm trying to get back in the league. Exactly. And, you know, I had – I graduated with my business degree at KU. Mm-hmm. So, I understood, you know, how to manage my money and stuff like that. So, for my first two seasons, I ain't need no job. I ain't, I ain't have to do nothing. You had money in the yep. bank. I was able to just keep grinding and waiting on the opportunity to make sure I'm ready if I got that call. So, after the, the second seed off season being home, that's when I was like, all right, well, I got to start doing something. Um, I always knew I had a passion of, with working with kids because mm-hmm. of what I did at Kansas with Big Bozo and Big Sister. So, um, yeah, so you've been working with kids. So most guys, you know, they get this money and they get in the league and, you know, they start feeling obligated. Like, oh, well, that's what we do, right? Like, you're supposed to, if you get money, help people. You was doing that at KU, the Big Brothers, Big Sisters. So let's go quick into that. Like, what made you say, you know what, I'm a college athlete and I know I got a crazy, hectic schedule, but I really want to get into the Big Brothers, Big Sisters. What made you get into that? Uh, just my family. Uh, I come from a big family. And so being at, being up there at school, I didn't really have family like that. My siblings, and I'm used to being a big brother and mm-hmm. um, a mentor, a role model and stuff like that. So that's what made me actually reach out. We had one off day. So I'm like, cool, it's an off day. So instead Do of something. all I was doing is going to hoop. You I'm know, playing that or me and you on Call of Duty. Yeah, we on, the, we on the duty. <laughs> so I'm like, you know what? Instead of doing that, man, let me go in and be a, a big to somebody who need a positive role model, especially male figures now. Exactly. So that's that. what got me into into wanting to do that. Okay, no, no. Like I said, that's cool because, like I said, I feel like most people do it out of pure. They feel obligated because now I got money and people going to look at me crazy if I don't start a yeah, foundation no. or do a kid's camp or this. No, you were doing that, you know, back in the day. So – I know we went out, but I wanted to, you know, let people know this ain't something I did because I was in the league. I was doing this in college. Like, I, that was truly on my heart to do. So, let's go back. So, we're transitioning, right? It, it's hard. And another big thing you said was what? You had two years to say, let me grind, let me do this, let me do that, because you saved money. Mm-hmm. Was that financial advisor? Was that you? Was that mom, dad? What made you save that money? Because we know yeah. the, stats, the stats show it. 80% of guys coming out the league broke within – two years or guys are broke while playing like how are you getting a million dollar check but you're in debt you're getting a million dollar check every week for 16 17 weeks and you're in debt so what helps you on the money side of to be able to save it while being in the league it was a little bit of everything I yeah. mean, one like it just go back to myself i've always been tight with money <laughs> if yeah. you ask people in my family um i'm tight with my money you that's know, the only thing. thing i spent my money on was shoes mm-hmm. and you know when it comes to my baby my car but, exactly um uh, other than that I was pretty cool with my money. Uh, my parents, you know, obviously they had the input. I did have a financial advisor who had the input as well. So I've always been pretty secure with my money and, and knowing that it don't last forever, especially playing ball. So Exactly. So now so we know you're doing your mentor thing. You're saving your money. But now, like I said, you're out the league. Mm-hmm. So you got money stashed up, and then you start shep up. What made you start that? How did it come about? What made you say, this is what I want to do? Um, a 
again, just came down to the love that I had working with kids. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, it was the passion I got with, with sports. And then just wanting to be, again, that positive role model for okay. a community. And when I came home, having an opportunity to impact the youth at a young age through sports, through something that I love, it was a no-brainer. So, you know, it took a little bit of time to actually get the plan together as far as how, my approach, how I wanted to go about it. But, you know, I decided that I wanted to do my own thing. And that's where Chef Up kind of came from. Um, me and my fiance, uh, currently we, you know, we was talking and just kind of figure out what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And it was something athletically, but also not forgetting academic side. Exactly. So when I first started Chef Up, I started um, working with just receivers and DBs. But as time progressed, again, I wanted to impact academics somehow. Mm -hmm. So that's when I um, created a three-week speed and agility clinic for middle school kids, which yeah. actually uh, TRPT helped with Devin, exactly. Devin My brother, Patterson, uh, yep. for those of y'all don't know, my uh, <laughs> brother, Devin Patterson. So how we do it, we talk about really collabing and really doing stuff as a family, really doing stuff to help others. So Ja'Cory and my brother actually work together in a lot of the clinics. So for people that are say, oh, I need to do this all by myself, and no, like TRPT is an amazing brand, and, and, and so is Chef Up. So why not come together? Mm -hmm. And just like TRPT is an amazing brand, why say, well, Chef Up, you trying to, you know, come up a little bit. You don't need to do our No, yeah. I send my brother, I encourage my brother to go out there and work with Ja'Cory because it's a good thing for him, good thing for Ja'Cory, mm -hmm. and good thing for the Everybody. kids, right? So it's not about us. You need to be doing this for other things. So, yeah, they're about to do a three-week camp here. They've already done a couple of them, mm -hmm. and they're about to start one over well, we spring actually, break. Well, right? that was, we actually got a yeah, spring break. It's a two-day camp. Two-day camp. So we're doing a spring break, two-day camp um, at Williams Middle School out in Rockwall. Okay, what, give them the dates real quick. Uh, it's a two-day two day $50 camp, March 12th, March 13th, up at uh, Williams Middle School in Rockwall. Okay, if this gets out before, hopefully you get yeah. you a few people if it get out after. Uh, Y'all missed yeah, out. We, we but we still, we're, yeah, we're but, and we've been putting it on the, um, on, so, online, online and social yeah. media, so we're getting it out there in that way. So now we're doing the business, Shep, up. what has been your, the hardest thing about growing your own business? What, what's that one hardest thing you say, if I had to, if I could take this out and, and it be given to me, what's that hardest thing you say? Just help me on this. Um, the hardest thing for me is patience. Yeah. You know, playing ball, I'm used to them checks being, you know, a nice yeah. little check every week. So there are times I feel like, man, I ain't doing enough. Mm -hmm. Like, I got to be doing more. I need to be doing more. I ain't got no clients. I ain't, you know what I'm saying? And exactly. Again, that, that goes back to my support system. So my fiance, no, uh, uh, you good, you good, you good. Stay the course. We got the vision. This is what we need to do. We keep doing this. We grow into this, and everything's gonna be fine. Where on me, on the other hand, like I say, I'm so. We want to do it. Yeah, We're like, athletes. We're competitive. Yep. If I'm, if I'm the best. I want to drop 50 tonight. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah, want I don't you right to now. tell me, like, well, in the next three weeks, you know, you can start making, no, my, I've been working. I want my shots to go in. I've been running my routes. I should catch the ball. I should get open. So in business, it's not like that all the time, yeah. right? You work, 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 work for three years, but it's not going to show immediately. Mm -hmm. Like if I go in an off season and really work on my free throws, I expect when I walk up to that line, Maybe my free throws are better, right? In business, I can work, 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 but it doesn't mean it's going to correlate today, mm -hmm. tomorrow, or even next oh, year. Man. Like most people, it takes 10, 15, 20 years. TRPT, people see it now and be like, man, DP, you killed it. Yes, I am. I started in, two, I started in 2013, but my dad started 25 years ago yeah. for us to get here, right? So y'all see the seven, but y'all don't see the other part. So it's that tip of the iceberg picture. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. But all the work's underneath. So that patience is big. And then you also talked about your fiance helping yeah. you. So what what have you done for like support? So you have her, do you yes. did you look for mentors? Like what else what is your support system look like? Uh well she is a lot of it, but obviously you you and your your father are big mentors. Uh Clay Mack is a mentor of Something. mine. Um and then also D Rob. D Rob oh, I know I shouted out Mac. Um and I'll shout out D-Rob as well because, like I said, we're out here to get better. And a lot of people see 
myself and Mac as competition, mm -hmm. myself and D-Rob competition. We've had family members go back and forth. Yeah. We've had clients. We've had everything go back and forth. That's nothing like that. So once again, I'm going to shout them out again. Shout out to Clay Mac. Shout out to D-Rob. Y'all keep doing what y'all doing, fellas. Yes, but go, go ahead. So you got Clay Mac, myself, my pops, D-Rob, your fiance, mm -hmm. in your circle, anybody else kind of like that as keeps of, you. As of right now, that's, and obviously my, my kid, uh, my daughter. That's, that's probably the biggest, oh, right? Yeah. That say, hey, when I'm tired, I better get my oh, butt up. I yeah. got to go. Because I, I want to leave a legacy. I want her to, to understand that. And, and that's just not, you know, coming from me as well. That's me and her mom. Me, me and exactly. my fiance. That's that's something we pride ourselves on big is just leaving a legacy for our kids. So that that that's super big. We've talked about that a lot in the community, a lot in the black community, mm -hmm. right? We gotta do that more. Leave something for our kids. Yeah. Like, not debt, not just yeah. words of wisdom, but leave them yeah, a house, leave them some land, leave them a business. We gotta start doing that more in our mm -hmm. community. So to see yourself do that, you know, when I have kids, I wanna do that. I want to, you know, be able to put my kids in the best situation possible. I remember back growing up when you look at people and be like, man, why they parents, they ain't got to do that expensive old class. Yeah. That class is overpriced. Well, if I feel like it's going to give my kid just this much, oh, right, yeah. you want to be able to give your kid that. That's so, if you so yeah, yeah, yeah. That. exactly. So that's big, and you have a different outlook on it when you start working with as many kids as I, as I have mm -hmm. and being a teacher and then you being a father now. So what has fatherhood, like, really done for you? Like, really, from a ball standpoint and, like, just a business? Like, is it just a focusing thing? Is it something to fall back on? Is it a time away from the world that you get to spend with it? Like, what has fatherhood, like, kind of did for you? It has really woke me up mm -hmm. um, in a way that I, I view the world totally different because I'm not just out here living for me, myself anymore. Uh, it's really been the best thing for me. Uh, as far as like helping me grow as a man, mature. I'm only 26. I'm mature for my age. Exactly. But Since I've known even, you, that even oh, that gave me the extra boost. Cause now I'm actually, you know, trying to look into putting the after school program together. And and that's what Give I giving back always. You know what I'm saying? That's something I have developed now. Cause it's like okay, I want to find more ways to to reach not just athletes. Mm -hmm. Because what if my what if my daughters grow up and they don't want to play sports? Well, if they want to do piano or sing or something like exactly. that. Still give them them resources. I still want to be how can Shep up help? So if Shep up cannot just be about athletics and it's also including academics. Now that's as I say with Shep up, I don't want to just change lives, I want to change generations. So now with the after school program, I'm able to do that because I'm able to have a dance team or a cheerleading team or something like that where you know, everybody feels like everybody they can be a part they, of yeah, what you do. Like, I only can go if I'm an athlete. No, you, no, come on. It's not just about that. It's so about, we went from yeah. being wide receiver and DB <laughs> trainer yep. to all sports mm -hmm. to all people. Yep. And I think that's the biggest thing is being inclusive, you know, mm -hmm. and everybody feeling like they can be a part of what you got going. So as we're wrapping up, I want you to tell people, like, what makes – so we. I just kind of went into it, right, mm -hmm. being more than just one – Thing as far as a trainer in football or whatever, but in your words, like what makes Shep up different than what you say TRPT or Clay Mack, D Rob or whoever? Like, what do you think would distinguish you from everybody else? Well, I think it, it all starts from my motto, Shep up. Uh, Shep up actually stands for smart, honest, and powerful, precise players under pressure. That's what I'm about building. And Again, like you say, once I cross over and trying to do that after school program, now it's not just about players, it's about people. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to just be that trainer who, oh, uh, yeah, I got faster. I, you know, I, I want to build their confidence. I want to make sure that when they're away from the field or from the court that they just as confident out in the real world. You want to be the person that 20 years from now, you want to say, hey, Coach Corey, thank you. Look at how my daughter's doing. Exactly. Hey, you want to come to our wedding. You want to come to our my kids graduate. You want to be more. more so yeah. and, and that's that's big right there. Too many people like you know, just see the athletic side. I want to be a true family. Yeah, yeah, and wow, and and that's big. So I think that distinguishes a lot of people. A lot of people say it, but a lot of people don't do it. Yeah. Like Tim. So anybody's going to say, as a trainer, as a teacher, as a parent to a kid, 
that school was important to you. Mm -hmm. How was it important to you if you had a 2.1 or 1.3? It wasn't important to you then. Well, how about now? Okay, well, you know, I've changed. I've seen the error in my ways. No, it's not. Because you're still letting these kids yeah. fail and come train with you or you're trying to, mm -hmm. we was looking at the uh, video yesterday of uh, Supreme Dreams of him yeah. talking to the teacher about the kid failing, right? So that's what a lot of coaches are still doing, but yet still promote that they're, you know, student athlete driven. I think the biggest way of going about it is doing what you're doing, really trying to show it and implement it. Yeah. So that's really, really big. Like I said, wrapping up, I want you to tell everybody, uh, we're looking in a good camera right there in the <laughs> cannon. Right there, tell them where they can find, you know, Shep Up, regardless if it's your, your website, your Instagram, Facebook, mm -hmm. whatever you got, and whatever information you want them to know about you leaving out. So let them know where they can find you. You can find me on ShepUp.com. No, that's my site, but also my, my Instagram is Shep underscore up. Uh, my Facebook is Shep Up LLC, or you can follow my personal account, it's Corey Shepard. Um, it was a pleasure being able to talk about my business and just being able to share my story. And I think that's important for players to be able to share their story, but also for individuals on the other side to, to understand because what y'all see is it's just on TV at that moment. Y'all don't understand, not everybody understands the process and everything that we deal with outside of the field or, you know, outside of the profession that we do. So again, I just I'm just blessed to have the opportunity to share my story and, and hopefully influence somebody somebody else. Yeah, so make sure y'all reach out to Jacory on everything that he just talked about from Facebook to Instagram to his website. Just know that he's only beginning. He, he has a journey, he has a story, and it's only getting better. But I really appreciate you, Ja'Cory. Like I said, this won't be our last one because, oh, hey, I know you're going to do more, so we're going to have to get you back on the show. But I appreciate you, my guy, and we're going to see y'all. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, 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 uh. We out. <laughs>